head, hair is real on his head. Unlike Trump's. Not some big floppy, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but I agree with everybody what they say in here. He supports us. He supports our needs. He's, we're important. He's not a bot politician. I don't think he's a bot politician at all. We, we need to get... Oh boy, I lost my train of thought. But, but go, go Bernie, right? And I'm sorry for you Minnesota fans. Go Hawks! We're playing the Gophers today. Vikings is the pro. <laughs> I'm Quinn. I am um, from Missouri, but I, I live in the Des Moines area now, which is nice because it's much more progressive. Because a lot of people from my home area would say that I'm at a Bernie rally because I'm a lazy millennial who wants to quit my job and get free stuff. So, <laughs> honestly, I'm, I'm supporting Bernie because. As the gentleman mentioned over here, he wants to get money out of politics, which I think everyone, a lot of people in here are probably passionate about race relations and women's rights and all those types of things. But it kind of becomes moot whenever at the beginning all of our politicians are being bought out by large corporations from the very start. And Citizens United has just made it even easier to do that. So seeing Bernie not have a super PAC and do it the right way, it's really inspiring. Your name, where you're from, why would Bernie be proud of you, and why you support Bernie Sanders? Yeah. Um, I'm John, I'm from Wisconsin. Uh, uh, so I support Bernie Sanders because he's funded by the average American and not uh, corporations and things like that. And I think he'd be proud of me today because uh, we got frozen yogurt, my girlfriend and I, and the gentleman at Orange Leaf looked down, so I gave him a few dollars tip, so that may have raised his wage a little bit more than minimum wage. So, uh. Who's next? Here we go, right here. Uh, my name's Jan of Des Moines, and uh, anybody who's lived in Iowa for a while knows that uh, several years back, we lost, what, two Supreme Court justices that were de defeated, three, defeated by out-of-state money. Um, recently, the Koch brothers uh, bought Joni Ernst's uh, Senate seat. It wasn't the people of Iowa that elected Joni Ernst, it was the Koch brothers. Uh, Bernie has made, has made it unequivocal, he would overturn Citizens United. <laughs> Pass down the mic, your name, where you're from, why you support Bernie, and what did you do today that Bernie will be proud of? All right, I'm Amber. I'm from Fargo, North Dakota. I go to drink. And um, I, well, Bernie would be proud of me because uh, I'm 18, so it's my first time voting, and I called my mom today telling her that I don't care who she's voting for, I'm voting for Bernie. Because he doesn't need a campaign, a negative campaign ad to draw the attention to himself. He brings that in ways that uh, to actually support people, like we've been saying. He cares about people, and that's what draws the attention. Not taking the attention away from other people by uh, drawing any kind of negative campaign ads. Hi, my name is Dennis. Uh, I'm a Drake alum. Uh, um, I support Bernie because uh, getting money out of politics and uh, reversing the destruction that it's caused on America is the number one important issue of our time. Um, right now we have more income inequality in America than uh, Rome did when before they fell and we saw how that did for them. So <laughs> I'm really hoping that Bernie gets in there and we actually make some change in this nation. <laughs> Uh, back that. Okay, well, we'll, we'll go there. Um, I was. <laughs> I'm originally from um, Honolulu, Hawaii, but now I go to school in Nebraska, and I support Bernie for a lot of different reasons. But 
I think one main one is that like he is trying to call attention to like the disgraceful racial injustice that is going on in our country right now. Hi, uh, my name is Ali, and uh, <clears throat> I'm a Drake alum as well. And uh, the only reason I'm going to vote for Bernie because he is a legend. Wait for it. Yeah. Jerry. Yeah. We're going up, we're going up. All right, here we go. Name where you're from, why Bernie would be proud of you today, and why you support Bernie Sanders. Louder. I'm a girl from the Midwest. I've been in several Midwestern cities. Flint, Michigan, Detroit, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I live in Chicago now, and I've seen the decline in the quality of life throughout the Midwest, throughout the country, and I think Brian, uh, Bernie would be proud of me because I can't be bought or sold. talking about the crisis in our educational system, the crisis in communities of color, mass incarceration rates, multinationals, destabilizing communities, countries, and I think he would be very proud of me for standing true. Thank you! Please, let's do one more! Who is it? Okay, I see you. Stand up. Yep, it's you. Hi guys, my name is Theo. Um, I like Bernie for all the issues that you guys have said today. You guys are an amazing group of people. Um, and I, I really like Bernie because I feel like he cares about us. He is us. And, and, and that really uh, means a lot that we can have somebody up on stage tonight who um, really cares about us and who cares about the things that we care about. Bernie would be proud of me because I'm 16, I live in D.C. And I'm working on passing oh, a bill I was moved. in D.C. I was moved, so that lets 16 and 17 year olds vote so that I can vote for Bernie in the election. <laughs> this kid has not yet old enough to vote, but uh, he already uh, supports Bernie. Uh, my name is Arik. I'm from New Jersey. Um, and, yeah. and I'm supporting Bernie because he was the first candidate to say that he wanted to ban private prisons in the United States. He the other candidates to say he wanted to go to the before any of their candidates. And he supported this act. He wants to ban private prisons. Alright, I'm, I'm Zach. I'm a student at Drake here. Um, the reason I'm supporting Bernie is because he wants to end the war on drugs. Nobody <laughs> suffering from the disease of addiction deserves to be in prison for as long as they, as long as the sentences are today for drug crimes. It's not right, and it's got to end, and Bernie's your man. And today, Bernie would be proud of me because I spread his message to literally everybody I can, whether, whether they're you know, not gonna vote, like straight, stay away from voting, like very adamant about not voting, or they're strongly Republican. I spread the message, and I tried to carry Bernie's message, his platform, to everybody I can. Okay, thank you guys. We're gonna start in five minutes, so this is your last bathroom break. We're gonna dim the lights, and we're gonna uh, watch the debate and cheer on Bernie! Get up, I move so you can get up. We're positioning the tripod so that it's easier for people to buy if they make sure.
I have one more power pack. Clearly, so. we're all ready. Could be 
behind in your coverage. We are farmers. Bum, 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 bum. Yes. There are no medals won for earning a living. It's just what you do for family. But it's hard to build a future if you can't see past today. That's why Walmart is investing in the most important part of our company. seconds to respond to our follow-ups. Any candidate who is attacked by another candidate gets 30 seconds for rebuttal. Here's how we'll keep time. After a question is asked, the green light goes on. When there are 15 seconds left, the candidate gets a yellow warning light. And when time is up, the light turns red, that means stop talking. <laughs> Those are the rules, so let's get started. You will each have one minute for an opening statement to share your thoughts about the attacks in Paris and lay out your vision for America first, Senator Sanders. Well, John, let me concur with you and with all Americans who are shocked and disgusted by what we saw in Paris yesterday. Together, leading the world, this country will rid our planet of this barbarous organization called ISIS. I'm running for president because as I go around this nation, I talk to a lot of people. And what I hear is people's concern that the economy we have is a rigged economy. People are working longer hours for low wages, and almost all of the new income and wealth goes to the top 1%. And then on top of that, we've got a corrupt campaign finance system in which millionaires and billionaires are pouring huge sums of money into super PACs, heavily influencing the political process. What my campaign is about is a political revolution Millions of people standing up and saying, enough is enough, our government belongs to all of us, and not just a handful of billionaires. Well, I that with the people of France tonight, but that is not enough. We need to have a resolve that will bring the world together to root out the kind of radical jihadist ideology that motivates organizations like ISIS, a barbaric, ruthless, violent, jihadist, terrorist group. This election is not only about electing a president, it's also about choosing our next commander-in-chief. And I will be laying out in detail what I think we need to do with our friends and allies in Europe and elsewhere to do a better job of coordinating efforts against the scourge of terrorism. Our country deserves no less because all of the other issues we want to deal with depend upon us being secure and strong. My heart, like all of us in this room, John, and all the people across our country, my hearts go out to the people of France in this moment of loss. Parents and and, and sons and daughters and family members. And um, as our hearts go out to them and as our prayers go out to them, we must remember this, that this is the new face of conflict and warfare, not in the 20th century, but the new face of conflict and warfare in the 21st century. And there is no nation on the planet better able to adapt to this change than our nation. 
we must be able to work collaboratively with others we must anticipate these threats before they happen this is the new sort of challenge the new sort of threat that does in fact require new thinking fresh approaches and new leadership as a former mayor and a former governor there was never a single day john when i went to bed or woke up without realizing that this could happen in our own country we have a lot of work to do to better prepare our nation and to better lead this world into this new century all right thank you governor thank all of you the terror attacks last night underscore the biggest challenge facing the next president of the united states at a time of crisis, the country and the world look to the president for leadership and for answers. So, Secretary Clinton, I'd like to start with you. Hours before the attacks, President Obama said, I don't think ISIS is gaining strength. 72% of Americans think the fight against ISIS is going badly. Won't the legacy of this administration, which, is, which you are a part of, won't that legacy be that it underestimated the threat from ISIS? Well, John, I think that uh, we have to look at ISIS as the leading threat of an international terror network. It cannot be contained, it must be defeated. There is no question in my mind that if we summon our resources, both our leadership resources and all of the tools at our disposal, not just military force, which should be used as a last resort, but our diplomacy, our development aid, law enforcement, sharing of intelligence in a much more uh, open and cooperative way, that we can bring people together, but it cannot be an American fight. And I think what the president has consistently said, which I agree with, is that we will support those who take the fight to ISIS. That is why we have troops in Iraq that are helping to train and build back up the Iraqi military, why we have special operators in Syria working with the Kurds and Arabs, so that we can be supportive, but this cannot be an American fight, although American leadership is essential. But uh, Secretary Clinton, the question was about... <laughs> I'll just add, the president referred to ISIS as the JVU in a speech to the Council on Foreign Relations in June of 2014 said, I could not have predicted the extent to which ISIS could be effective in seizing cities in Iraq. So you've got prescriptions for the future, but how, how do we know if those prescriptions are any good if you missed it in the past? Well, John, look, I think that what happened when we abided by the agreement that George W. Bush uh, made with the Iraqis to leave uh, by 2011 is that an Iraqi army was left that had been trained and that was prepared to defend Iraq. Unfortunately, Nuri al-Maliki, the prime minister, set about decimating it. And then with the revolution against Assad, and I did early on say we needed to try to find a way to train and equip moderates very early so that we would have a better idea of how to deal with Assad because I thought there would be uh, extremist groups filling the vacuum. So yes, this has developed. I think that there are many other reasons why it has in addition uh, to what happened in the region, but I don't think that the United States uh, has the bulk of the responsibility. I really put that on Assad and on the Iraqis and on the region itself. Okay, Governor O'Malley, would you critique the administration's response to ISIS? If the United States doesn't lead, who leads? No, I, I, would, uh, I would disagree with, with Secretary Clinton respectfully on this score. Uh, this actually is America's fight. It cannot solely be America's fight. America is best when we work in collaboration with our allies. America is best when we are actually standing up to evil in this world. And ISIS, make no mistake about it, is an evil in this world. ISIS has brought down a Russian airliner. ISIS has now attacked a Western democracy in, in France. And we do have a role in this, not solely ours, but we must work collaboratively with other nations. The great failing of these last 10 or 15 years, John, has been our failing of human intelligence on the ground. Our role in the world is not to roam the globe looking for new dictators to topple. Our role in the world is to make ourselves a beacon of hope, make ourselves stronger at home, but also our role in the world, yes, is also to confront evil when it rises. We took out the safe haven in Afghanistan, but now there is undoubtedly a larger safe haven, and we must rise to this occasion in collaboration and with alliances to confront it and invest in the future much better human intelligence so we know what the next steps are. Senator Sanders, you said you want to rid the planet of ISIS. In the previous debate, you said the greatest threat to national security was climate change. Do you still believe that? Absolutely. In fact, climate change is directly related to the growth of terrorism. And if we do not get out of the country, we can 
countries all over the world. This is what the CIA says. They're going to be struggling over limited amounts of water, limited amounts of land to grow their crops, and you're going to see all kinds of international conflict. But of course, international terrorism is a major issue that we have got to address today. And I agree with much of what the, the Secretary and, and the Governor have said. But let me have one area of, of, of disagreement with the Secretary. I think she said something like, the bulk of the responsibility is not... Well, in fact, I would argue that the disastrous invasion of Iraq, something that is the the region completely, and led to the rise of Al-Qaeda uh, and to uh, ISIS. Now, in fact, what we have got to do, and I think there is widespread agreement here, is the United States cannot do it alone. What we need to do is lead an international coalition which includes, very significantly, the Muslim nations in that region who are going to have to fight and defend their way of life. Sanders, when you said the disastrous vote on Iraq, uh, let's just be clear about what you're saying. You're saying Secretary Clinton, who was then Senator Clinton, voted for the Iraq war. And are you making a direct link between her vote for that war and what's happening now for us? It's just well, I, don't think think any, I don't think any sensible person would disagree that the invasion of Iraq led to the massive level of instability we are seeing right now. I think that was one of the worst foreign policy blunders in the United States. Thank you, John. Well, I think it's important when we think about the Iraq war and put this in historic context. The United States has, unfortunately, been victimized by terrorism going back decades. Oh, uh, in the no. 1980s, it was in Beirut, Lebanon, under President Reagan's administration, and 258 Americans, Marines, embassy personnel mm -hmm. were uh, murdered. We also had attacks on two of our embassies in uh, Tanzania and Kenya, uh, when my husband was president. Again, Americans murdered. And then, of course, 9-11 happened, which happened before there was an invasion of Iraq. I have said the invasion of Iraq was a mistake, but I think if we're ever going to really tackle the problems posed by jihadi extreme terrorism, we need to understand it and realize that it has uh, antecedents to what happened in Iraq, and we have to continue to be vigilant about it. Senator Sanders, let me just follow this line of thinking. You've criticized then-Senator Clinton's vote. Do you have anything to criticize in the way she performed as Secretary of State? I think we have a disagreement. Uh, and uh, the disagreement is that not only did I vote against the war in Iraq, if you look at history, John, you will find that regime change, whether it was in the early 50s in Iran, whether it was toppling Salvador Allende in Chile, uh, whether it is overthrowing the government of Guatemala way back when, these invasions, these in of governments, regime changes have unintended consequences. I would say that on this issue, I'm a little bit more conservative than the secretary. All right, so uh, and that I am not a great fan of regime change. Senator, let me John, jump. John, may I may interject here? Secretary Clinton also said that we left behind. It was not just the invasion of Iraq, which Secretary Clinton voted for, and in essence said was a big mistake, and indeed it was. But it was also the cascading effects that followed that. It was also the disbanding of uh, many elements of the Iraqi army that are now showing up as part of ISIS. It was uh, 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 country after country without making the investment in human intelligence to understand who the new leaders were and the new forces were that are coming up. We need to be much more far th thinking in this new 21st century era of, of nation state failures and conflict. It's not just about getting rid of a single dictator. It is about understanding the secondary and third consequences that fall next. All right, Secretary. Well, it, and it, of course, each of these cases needs to be looked at individually and analyzed. Part of the problem that we have currently in the Middle East is that Assad has hung on to power uh, with the very strong support of Russia and Iran and with the proxy of uh, Hezbollah uh, being there basically fighting his battles. So I don't think you can paint with a broad brush. This is an incredibly complicated region of the world. It's become more complicated. And many of the fights that are going on are not ones that the United States has either started or have a role in. The Shia uh, Sunni split, the 
dictatorships that have suppressed people's aspirations, the increasing globalization without any real safety valve for people to have a better life. We saw that in Egypt. We saw a dictator overthrown. We saw a Muslim Brotherhood president installed. And then we saw him ousted and the army back. So I think we've got to understand the complexity of the world that we are facing, and no place is more so than in the Middle East. I understand. Quickly, Senator. Well, the, the, the Secretary is obviously right. It is enormously complicated. Uh, but here's something that I believe we have to do as we put together an international coalition. And that is we have to understand that the Muslim nations in the region, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey, Jordan, all of these nations, they're going to have to get their hands dirty, their boots on the ground. They are going to have to take on ISIS. This is a war for the soul of Islam. And those countries who are opposed to Islam, they are going to have to get deeply involved in a way that is not the case today. We should be supportive of that effort. So should the UK, so should France. But those Muslim countries are going to have to lead the effort. They are not doing it now. Well, I, Clinton, think, I, I think that is very unfair to a few that you mentioned, uh, most particularly Jordan, which has put a lot on the line for the United States, has also taken in hundreds of thousands of refugees from Syria, and has been therefore subjected to threats and attacks uh, by extremists themselves. I do agree that in particular, Turkey and the Gulf nations have got to make up their minds. Are they going to stand with us against this kind of jihadi radicalism or not? And there are many ways of doing it. They can provide forces, they can provide resources, but they need to be absolutely clear about where they stand. Let me ask you, Secretary Clinton, a question about leadership. We're talking about what role does America take? Let me ask you about Libya. So Libya is a country in which ISIS has uh, taken hold in part because of the chaos after Muammar Gaddafi. That was an operation you championed. President Obama says this is the lesson he took from that operation. In an interview, he said the lesson was, do we have an answer for the day after? Wasn't that supposed to be one of the lessons that we learned after the Iraq war? And how did you get it wrong with Libya if the key lesson of the Iraq war is have a plan for after? Well, we did have a plan. And I think it's uh, fair to say that uh, of all of the Arab leaders, Gaddafi probably had more blood on his hands of Americans than anybody else. And when he moved on his own people, threatening uh, a massacre, genocide, uh, the Europeans and the Arabs, our allies and partners, uh, did ask for American help and we provided it. And we didn't put a single boot on the ground and uh, Gaddafi was deposed. The Libyans turned out for one of the most successful, fairest elections that any Arab country has had. They elected moderate leaders. Now, there has been a lot of turmoil and trouble as they have tried to deal with these radical elements, which you find in this arc of instability from North Africa to Afghanistan. And it is imperative that we do more, not only to help our friends and partners protect themselves and protect our own homeland, but also to work to try to deal with this arc of instability, which does have a lot of impact on what happens in a country like Libya. Governor I, I want to ask you a question, and you can add whatever you'd like to, but let me ask you, is the world too dangerous a place for a governor who has no foreign policy experience? But the world is not too dangerous of a place for the United States of America, provided we act according to our principles, provided we act intelligently. I mean, let's talk about this arc of, of instability that Secretary Clinton talked about. Libya is now a mess. Syria is a mess. Uh, Iraq is a mess. Afghanistan is a mess. As Americans, we have shown ourselves um, uh, to have the greatest military on the face of the planet. But we are not so very good at anticipating threats and appreciating just how difficult it is to build up stable democracies, to make the investments in sustainable development that we must as a nation if we were to attack the root causes of, uh, of these sorts of, of instability. And I wanted to add one other thing, John, and I think it's important for all of us on this stage. I was in Burlington. Iowa. And a mom of a service member of ours who served two duties in Iraq said, Governor O'Malley, please, when you're with your other candidates and colleagues on, on stage, please don't use the term boots on, Iraq, on the ground. Please don't use the term boots on the ground. My son is not a pair of boots on the ground. These are American soldiers, and we fail them 
when we fail to take into account what happens the day after a dictator falls and when we fail to act with a whole of government approach with sustainable development diplomacy and our economic power in alignment with our principles well i think it's perfectly um fair to say that we invested quite a bit in development aid um some of the bravest people that i had the privilege of working with as secretary of state were our development professionals who went sometimes alone sometimes with our military into very dangerous places in iraq in afghanistan uh elsewhere so there does need to be a whole of government approach but just because we're involved and we have a strategy doesn't mean we're going to be able to dictate the outcome. These are often very long-term kinds of uh, investments that when have to be made. When, when, when you talk about the long-term consequences of war, let's talk about the men and women who came home from war. The 500,000 who came home with PTSD and traumatic brain injury. And I would hope that in the midst of all of this discussion, this country makes certain that we do not turn our backs on the men and women who put their lives on the line to defend us and that we stand with them as they have stood with us. Secretary Clinton, you mentioned radical jihadists. Yes. Marco Rubio, also running for president, said that this attack showed, and the attack in Paris showed, that we are at war with radical Islam. Do you agree with that characterization, radical Islam? I don't think we're at war with Islam. I don't think we're at war with all Muslims. I think we're at war with jihadists who have... Just to interrupt, uh, he didn't yes. say all Muslims. He just said radical Islam. Is that a phrase you don't... I, I think that you can, you can talk about Islamists who um, clearly are also jihadists, but I think it's, it, it's not particularly helpful to make the case that uh, Senator Sanders was just making that I agree with, that we've got to reach out to Muslim countries. We've got to have them be part of our coalition. If they hear people running for uh, president who basically short cut it to say we are somehow against Islam. That was one of the real contributions, despite all the other problems that George W. Bush made after 9-11 when he basically said after going to a mosque in Washington, we are not at war with Islam or Muslims. We are at war with violent extremism. We are at war with people who use their religion for purposes of power and oppression. Um, and yes, we are at war with those people, but I don't want us to be painting with too broad a brush. The reason I ask is that you gave a speech at Georgetown University in which you said that it was important to show, quote, respect even for one's enemies, trying to understand and insofar as psychologically possible, empathize with their perspective and point of view. Can you explain what that means in the context of this kind of barbarism? I think with this kind of barbarism and nihilism, um, it's very hard to understand other than the lust for power, the rejection of modernity, the total disregard for human rights, uh, freedom, or any other value that we know and uh, respect. <laughs> Historically, it is important to try to understand your adversary in order to figure out how they are thinking, what they will be doing, how they will react. Um, I, I plead uh, that it's very difficult when you deal with uh, ISIS and organizations like that whose, whose behavior is so barbaric and so vicious uh, that it doesn't seem to have any purpose other than lust for killing and power and that that's very difficult to put ourselves in no, other shape. Do, do, do either, no, just very quickly, do either of you ra radical Islam, do either of you use I don't, that I don't phrase? think the term is what's important. What is important to understand <laughs> is we have organizations, whether it is ISIS or Al-Qaeda, who do believe we should go back several thousand years. We should make women third class citizens, that we should allow children to be sexually assaulted that they are a danger to modern society and that this world with American leadership can and must come together to destroy him. We can do that. John. And it requires an entire world to come together, including in a very active way, the Muslim nations. Governor Abel, you've been making the case when you talk about lack of forward vision, you're essentially saying that Secretary Clinton lacks that vision and this critique matches up with this discussion of language. The critique is that the softness of language betrays the softness of approach. So if this language, if you don't call it by what it is, how can your approach be effective to the cause? That's the critique. I believe calling it what it is is to say radical jihadis. That's to call it what it is. But John, let's not fall into the trap of thinking that all of our Muslim 
american neighbors in this country are somehow our enemies here they are our first line of defense and we are going to be able to defeat isis on the ground there as well as because of the muslim americans in our country and throughout the world who understand that this brutal and barbaric group is perverting the name of a great world religion and now like never before we need our muslim american neighbors to stand up and to uh, and to be a part of this secretary clinton the uh, french president has called this attack an act of war yes. a couple of days ago you were asked if you would declare war on ISIS, and you said no. Would you? Would you? What would you say now? Well, we ha we have an authorization to use military force against terrorists. We uh, passed it after 9/11. And you think that covers all of this? It, it certainly does cover it. I, I would like to see it updated. If you were in the Senate, if you were in the Senate, would you be okay with uh, the Commander in Chief doing that without coming back to you? No, it would have to go through the Congress. And I know the White House has actually been working with members of Congress. Maybe now we can get it moving again, so that we can upgrade it, so that it does include all the tools and everything in our arsenal that we can use to try to work with our allies and our friends, come up with better intelligence. You know, it is difficult finding intelligence that is actionable in a lot of these places, but we have to keep trying. And we have to do more to prevent the flood of foreign fighters who have gone to Syria, especially the ones with Western passports, to come back. So there's a lot of work we need to do, and I want to be sure that what's called the AUMF has the authority that is needed going forward. Go on, Senator. Well, let me just, uh, uh, let's add to whatever you've got to say. <laughs> refugees. You've been a little vague on what you do about the Syrian refugees. I mean, What's your view on them now? Let me, let me do that, but let me pick up an issue, a very important issue that we have not yet discussed. This nation is the most powerful military in the world. We're spending over $600 billion a year on the military. And yet significantly less than 10% of that money is used to be fighting international terrorism. We are spending hundreds of billions of dollars maintaining 5,000 nuclear weapons. I think we need major reform in the military, making it more cost effective, but also focusing on the real crisis that faces us. The Cold War is over, and our focus has got to be on intelligence, increased manpower, fighting international terrorists. In terms of refugees, I believe that the United States has a moral responsibility with Europe, with Gulf countries, like Saudi Arabia, to make sure that when people leave countries like Afghanistan and Syria with nothing more than the clothing on their back, then of course we reach out. Now, what the magic number is, I don't know, because we don't know the extent of the problem. But I certainly think that the United States should take its full responsibility in helping those. Governor Mali, you have a magic number. I think it's 65,000. Does that number go up or down based on what happened yesterday? John, I was the first person on this stage to say that we should accept the 65,000 Syrian refugees that were, were fleeing the sort of murder of, uh, of ISIL. And I believe that that needs to be done with proper screening. But accommodating 65,000 refugees in our country today, people of 320 million, is akin to making room for six and a half more people in a baseball stadium with 32,000. There are other ways to lead and to be a moral leader in this world rather than at the opposite end of a drone strike. But I would want to agree with something that Senator Sanders says. The nature of warfare has changed. This is not a conflict where we send in the third division of Marines. This is a, a new era of conflict where traditional ways of, of huge standing armies are not as uh, serve our purposes as well as special ops, better intelligence, and being more proactive. Just very quickly, 65,000, the number stays. That's what I understand is the request from the international. But for uh, you, what, what do you want? I would want us to take our place among the nations of the okay. world to alleviate this sort of death and right. the, the, the specter we saw of little kids Secretary, bodies washing Secretary, up on a beach. Secretary Clinton, let me ask you a question from Twitter, which has come in. Uh, and this is a question on this issue of, uh, of refugees. The question is, with the U.S. preparing to absorb Syrian refugees, how do you propose we screen those coming in to keep our citizens safe? I think that is the number one requirement. I also said that we should take uh, uh, increased numbers of refugees. The administration originally said 10. I said we should go to 65. But 
only if we have as careful a screening and vetting process as we can imagine whatever resources it takes because i do not want us to in any way inadvertently allow people who wish us harm to come into our country but i want to say a quick word about what senator sanders and and then um and governor o'malley said we do have to take a hard look at the defense budget and we do have to figure out how we get ready to fight the adversaries of the future not the past but we have to also be very clear that we do have some continuing challenges we've got challenges in the south china sea because of what china is doing and building up uh these uh, military installations we have problems with russia just the other day russia allowed a uh, television camera to see the plans for a drone submarine that could carry a tactical nuclear weapon so we've got to look at the full range and then come to some smart decisions about ha having more streamlined and focused defense. all right defense. Senator Sanza, i'm sorry we're going to have to take a break now we will have more of the democratic debate here from drake university in des moines Iowa. Secretary Clinton, first to you. You want to cap individuals' prescription drug costs at $250 a month. You want to make public college debt-free. You want community college to be free altogether, and you want mandatory paid family leave. So who pays for all that? Is it employers? Is it the taxpayers? And which taxpayers? Well, first of all, it isn't the middle class. I have made very clear that uh, hardworking middle class families need a raise, not a tax increase. In fact, uh, 
wages adjusted for inflation haven't risen since uh, uh, the turn of the last century after my husband's administration. So we have a lot of work to do to get jobs going again, get incomes rising again. And I have laid out specific plans. You can go to my website, HillaryClinton.com, and read the details. And I will pay for it by, yes, taxing the wealthy more, closing corporate loopholes, deduction, favorable treatment, and I can do it without raising the debt, without and making it reasonably uh, manageable within our budget so that we can be fiscally responsible at the same time. But a quick follow-up on that $250 a month cap. Wouldn't the pharmaceutical companies and the insurance companies just pass that cost on to the consumers in the form of higher premiums? Well, we're going to have to redo the way the prescription drug uh, industry does business. For example, it is outrageous that we don't have an opportunity for Medicare to negotiate for lower prices. In fact, American uh, consumers pay the highest prices in the world for drugs that we helped to be developed through the National Institutes of Health and that we then tested through the FDA. So there's more to my plan than just the cap. We have to go after price gouging and monopolistic practices and get Medicare the authority to negotiate. Governor O'Malley, you also want to make public college debt free. You want to right. states to freeze tuition. Uh, you've got your own family leave plan. How would you pay for it? In Maryland, you raise the sales tax, you raise the gas tax, and you raise taxes on families making over $150,000 a year. Is that the blueprint? Uh, that's it. The blueprint in Maryland that we followed was, yes, we did, in fact, raise the uh, sales tax by a penny, and we made our public schools the best public schools in America for five years in a row with that investment. And yes, we did ask everyone, the, the top 14% of earners in our state, to pay more in their income tax, and we were the only state to go four years in a row without a penny's increase to college tuition. So while other candidates will talk about the things they would like to do, I actually got these things done in a state that defended not only a AAA bond rating, but the highest median income in America. I believe that we pay for many of the things that we need to do again as a nation, investing in the skills of our people, our infrastructure, and research and development, and also climate change uh, by the elimination of one big entitlement that we can no longer afford as a people and that is the entitlement that many of our super wealthiest citizens feel they are entitled to pay namely a much lower income tax rate and a lower tax rate on capital gains I believe capital gains for the most part should be taxed the same way we tax incomes from hard work sweat and toil if we do those things we can be a, a country that actually can't afford debt free college again Senator Sanders, you want to make public college free altogether. You want to increase social security benefits, and you want to send, spend a trillion dollars on infrastructure. So you said that to do some of these things, you'll impose a tax on top earners. How high would their rate go in a Sanders administration? Let me put those proposals, and you're absolutely right. That is what I want to do. That is what has to happen if we're going to revitalize and rebuild the crumbling middle class. Uh, in the last 30 years, there has been a massive redistribution of wealth. And I know that term gets my Republican friends nervous. Problem is, this redistribution has gone in the wrong direction. Trillions of dollars have gone from the middle class and working families to the top one-tenth of one percent who have doubled the percentage of wealth they now own. Yes, I do believe that we must end corporate loopholes such that major corporations year after year pay virtually zero in federal income tax because they're stashing the money in the Cayman Islands. Yes, I do believe there must be a tax on Wall Street speculation. Yeah! 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 be able to go to college tuition free. So we pay for this by due demanding that the wealthiest people and the largest corporation who have gotten away with murder for years stop paying their fair share. Well, let's get specific. How high would you go? You said before you'd go above 50%. How high? We haven't come up with an exact number yet, but it will not be as high as the number under Dwight D. Eisenhower, which was 90%. But it will be. <laughs> not that much of a socialist compared to Eisenhower. <laughs> As Warren Buffett often reminds us That's right. that billionaires pay an effective tax rate lower than nurses or truck drivers. That makes no sense at all. There has to be real tax reform 
and the wealthiest little large corporations will pay when I'm president. I mean, that's why I have to write it down. And in talking to a lot of our neighbors who are in that super wealthy millionaire and billionaire category, great numbers of them love their country enough to do more again in order to create more opportunity for America's middle class. Secretary Clinton, Americans say that health care costs and wages are their top financial concerns, and health care deductibles alone have risen 67% over the past five years. Is this something that Obamacare was designed to address, and if not, why not? Well, look, I believe that we've made great progress as a country with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we've been struggling to get this done since Harry Truman, and it was not only a great accomplishment of the Democratic Party, but of President Obama. I do think that it's important to defend it. The Republicans have voted to repeal it nearly 60 times. They would like to rip it up and start all over again, throw our nation back into this really contentious debate that we've had about health care for quite some time now. I want to build on and improve the Affordable Care Act. I would certainly tackle the cost issues because I think that once the foundation was laid with a system to try to get as many people as possible into it to end insurance discrimination against people with pre-existing conditions or women, for example, that yes, we were going to have to figure out how to get more competition in the insurance market, how to get the costs of particularly prescription drugs but other out-of-pocket expenses down. But I think it's important to understand with Senator Sanders about how best to provide quality, affordable health care for everyone. And it's it's a worthy debate. It's an important one that we should be it engaged is, in. It is a worthy debate. Uh, Senator Sanders, a quick response, and then we'll get uh, into health care again later. I am on the committee that helped write the Affordable Care Act. We have made some good progress. Now what we have to take on is the pharmaceutical industry that is ripping off the American people every single day. Take Americans over the Canadian border to buy breast cancer drugs for one tenth the price they were paying in the United States. But at the end of the day, no doubt, the Affordable Care Act is a step forward. I think we all support it. I believe we've got to go further. I want to end the international embarrassment of the United States of America being the only major country on earth that doesn't guarantee health care to all people everywhere. <laughs> What we should be clear about is we end up spending, and I think the secretary knows this, far more per capita on health care than any other major country, and our outcomes, health care outcomes, are not necessarily. Right, Nancy, I really I'm wish you'd come back to me on this one, John, no, because we've actually found a way to reduce Governor? hospital costs. So whatever we come Governor, you're breaking the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're going to have to cut for a commercial. We'll be right back here for Drake University. <laughs>
Chicago. Sunday on 60 Minutes, the new Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. Can he fix Washington? Have you spoken to the President? No. KCCI and Kathy Abradovich of the Des Moines Register. Kevin? Thanks, John. Candidates, we've already uh, heard your answers on what you would do with Syrian refugees. But a crucial part of the immigration debate here at home is control of our own borders. Republicans say the borders, securing borders, is a top priority. Democrats say they want to plan for comprehensive immigration reform. So, Governor O'Malley, are you willing to compromise on this particular issue to focus on border security first in favor of keeping the country safe? Well, Mr. Kelly, we've actually been focusing on border security to the exclusion of talking about comprehensive immigration reform. In fact, if more border security and these and more and more deportations were going to bring our Republican brothers and sisters to the table, it would have happened long ago. The fact of the matter is, and let's say it in our debate, because you'll never hear this from that uh, immigrant bashing carnival barker, Donald Trump. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, net immigration from Mexico last year was zero. Fact check me. Go ahead and check it out. But the truth of the matter is, if we want wages to go up, we've got to get 11 million of our neighbors out of the off-the-book shadow economy and into the full life of an American economy. That's what our parents and grandparents always did. That's what we need to do as a nation. Yes, we must protect our borders, but there is no substitute for having comprehensive immigration reform with a pathway to citizenship for people, uh, many of whom have known no other country but the United States of America. You said you would go further than the president when it comes to taking executive action to implement immigration reforms. But the president is already facing legal troubles on this. We've seen it more just in the past week. Realistically, how could you go further with executive action? Well, first of all, I know that um, the president has appealed the uh, decision uh, to the Supreme Court. And my reading of the law and the Constitution uh, convinces me that the president has the authority that he is attempting to exercise with respect to dreamers and their parents because I think all of us on this stage agree that uh, we need comprehensive immigration reform with a path to citizenship. Border security has always been a part of that debate uh, and it is a fact that the uh, net immigration from uh, Mexico and South has basically zeroed out. So what we want to do is to say, look, we have 11 million people who have been here, many of them for decades. They have children who are doing so well. I've met and worked with dreamers. I think any parent would be so proud of them. So let's move toward what we should be doing as a nation and follow the values of our immigration history and begin to make it possible for them to come out of the shadows and to have a future that gives them a talked about immigration as being a wage issue in the United States, and I want to actually go directly to the wage issue now. Uh, you've called for raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour everywhere in the country, but the president's former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, Alan Kruger, has said a national increase of $15 could lead to undesirable and unintended consequences of job loss. What level of job loss would you consider unacceptable? Let me say this. So, you know, no public policy doesn't have in some cases negative consequences but at the end of the day what you have right now are millions of Americans working two or three jobs because their wages that they are earning are just too low real inflation accounted for wages has declined precipitously over the years so I believe that in fact this country needs to move toward a living wage 
it is not a radical idea to say that if somebody works 40 hours a week, that person should not be living in poverty. It is not a radical idea to say that a single mom should be earning enough money to take care of her kids. So I believe that over the next few years, not tomorrow, but over the next few years, we have got to move the minimum wage to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour, and I apologize to nobody for that. Do you, do you think job losses are a consequence? This is, of what I think. this is what many economists believe. That one of the reasons that real unemployment in this country is 10%, one of the reasons that African-American youth unemployment oh. and underemployment is 51%, if the average worker in America doesn't have any disposable income, you have no disposable income when you're making 10, 12 bucks an hour. When we put money into the hands of working people, they're going to go out buy goods, they're going to go out buy services, and they are going to create jobs in doing that. And this was not merely theory in Maryland. We actually did it. Not only were we the first state in the nation to pass a living wage, we were the first to pass a minimum wage. And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which hardly ever says nice things about Democratic governors anywhere, <laughs> made our state number one for innovation and entrepreneurship. We defended the highest median income in the country. And uh, uh, so look, the way that the, the, a stronger middle class is actually the source of economic growth. And if our middle class makes more money, they spend more money and our whole economy grows. We did and it worked. And nobody headed for the hills or left the state because of it. You're calling for a fifteen dollar minimum wage now, but why did you stop at ten ten in your state? Ten ten was all I could get the state to do by the time I left in my last year. But two of our counties actually went to twelve eighty. And their county executives, if they were here tonight, would also tell you that it works. The fact of the matter is the more our people earn, the more money they spend, and the more our whole economy grows. But this is not an esoteric article, uh, argument. You're seeing cities like Seattle, you're seeing cities like San Francisco, cities like Los Angeles doing it, and they are doing it well, and workers are able to have more disposable income. But I do take what Alan Kruger said seriously. He is the foremost expert in our country on mm -hmm. what its effects uh, are. And the overall message yeah, right. is that it doesn't result in job loss. However, what Alan Kruger said in the piece you're referring to is that if we went to $15, there are no international comparisons. That is why I support a $12 national federal minimum wage. That is what the Democrats in the Senate have put forward as a uh, proposal. But I do believe that is a minimum. And places like Seattle, like Los Angeles, like New York City, sure. they can go higher. It's what happened in uh, Governor O'Malley's state. There was a minimum wage at the state level and some places went higher. I think that is the hardest way to be able to move forward because if you go to 12, it would be the highest historical average oh, we've ever on. had. Yeah, but look, it should always be going up. I mean, well, with all due respect to Secretary You would Secretary index it to the median wage. Of course, you would yeah, do the 12 and you would yeah. index it. But I, I think we need to stop <laughs> taking our advice from economists on Wall Street He's and start taking it. <laughs> You have given me the perfect segue. We're going to talk about Wall Street, but now we've got to go okay. to do a commercial. <laughs> Thank you.
Because every one of us is doing one thing only. Making cancer history. Coming this February, the CBS News Republican Presidential Debate. Hey, on KCCR, it's the news report. The Democratic debate is here, and I was news leader. On a special live edition of Close Up, we discuss the biggest events of the night, the crucial world the moderators play, what each of the three candidates did to help them either win or lose the debate, and what this debate meant for the island voters, plus the behind-the-scenes planning that helped pull off this event. Join us on Sunday for KCCI 8 News Close Up. The stack on the left has all of the information you need to make a decision about which Medicare Part D plan is right for you. The sheet on the right also has all of the information you need to make a decision about which Medicare Part D plan is right for you. The difference? The one on the right can save you time and lose your work. Your trusted IV pharmacist can help you review your Medicare Part D plan options. Then you pick the plan that's right for you. Visit your IV pharmacy today for a free Medicare Part D plan report. said, quote, people should be suspect of candidates who receive large sums of money from Ooh. Wall Street. And then go out and say, trust me, I'm going to regulate Wall Street. Oh, yeah. So you've received millions of dollars in contributions and speaking fees from Wall Street companies. How do you convince voters that you're going to level the playing field when you're indebted to some of its biggest players? This is going to be well, good. You've got two billionaire hedge fund managers who started a super PAC and they're advertising against me in Iowa as we speak. Uh, so they clearly think I'm going to do what I say I will do. And you can look at what I did in the Senate. I did introduce legislation to rein in uh, compensation. I looked at ways that the shareholders would have more control over what was going on in that arena. And specifically said to Wall Street that uh, what they were doing in the mortgage market was bringing our country down. Uh, I've laid out a very aggressive uh, plan to rein in Wall Street, not just the big banks. That's a part of the problem, and I am going right at them. I've got a comprehensive, tough plan. But I went further than that. We have to go after what's called the shadow banking industry, those hedge funds. Look at what happened in 08. AIG, a big insurance company, Lehman Brothers, an investment bank, helped to bring our economy down. So I want to look at the whole problem, and that's why my proposal is much more comprehensive than anything else that's been put forth. Oh, Senator Sanders, you've, you've said that the donations to Secretary Clinton are compromising. So what do you think of her answer? <laughs> Not good enough. <laughs> I mean, you know, let's not be naive about it. Why do, uh, why over her political career has Wall Street been a major, the major uh, campaign contributor to Hillary Clinton? Uh, 
Now maybe they're dumb and they don't know what they're going to get, but I don't think so. Here is the major issue when we talk about Wall Street. It ain't complicated. You got six financial institutions today that have assets of 56 percent, equivalent to 56 percent of the GDP in America. They issue two thirds of the credit cards and one third of the mortgages. If Teddy Roosevelt, a good Republican, were alive today, you know what he'd say? Break them up. It doesn't have a super PAC. I'm not asking Wall Street or the billionaires for money. I will break up these banks, support community banks and credit unions. Credit unions, that's the future of banking. This is a new what they're going to get. What are they going to get? I have never heard a candidate, never, who has received huge amounts of money from oil, from coal, from Wall Street, from the military industrial complex. Not one candidate is up. This campaign contribution will not mm -hmm. I'm gonna be independent. But why do they make millions of dollars of campaign <laughs> contributions? They expect to get something, everybody knows that. Once again, I am running a campaign differently than any other candidate. We are relying on small campaign donors, 750,000 of them, 30 bucks a piece. <laughs> Impugn my integrity. Let's be no, frank here. Oh, wait a minute. You are not the hundreds of thousands of donors, most of them small, and I'm very proud that for the first time, a majority of my donors are women, 60%. In New York, and I represented New York on 9 11. When we were attacked, where were we attacked? We were attacked in downtown Manhattan, where yeah. Wall Street is. I did spend a whole lot of time and effort helping them rebuild. That was good for New York, it was good for the economy, yeah, right. and it was a way to rebuild the terrorism and win attack on the country. I agree to say what you're going to say, but I looked very carefully at your proposal. Reinstating Glass Steagall is a part of what very well could help, but it is nowhere near enough. My proposal is tougher, more effective, and more comprehensive because I go after all of Wall Street, not just the big banks. Oh my God. Oh my God. This issue touches on two broad issues. It's not just Wall Street. It's campaign a corrupt campaign finance system. And it's easy to talk the talk about ending uh, Citizens United, but what I think we need to do is show by example that we are prepared to not rely on large corporations and Wall Street for campaign contributions, and that's what I'm doing. In terms of Wall Street, I respectfully disagree with you, Madam Secretary, in the sense that the issue here is when you have such incredible power and such incredible wealth, when you have Wall Street spending $5 billion over a 10 year period to get, re re to get deregulated, the only answer that I know is break them up. Right. We establish class Senator, we have to get another nine. Yeah. With a look at your answer, how many Wall Street uh, veterans would you have in your administration? Well, I'll tell you what, I've said this before. I, I, I don't. I believe that we actually need some new economic thinking in the White House. And I would not have Robert Rubin or Larry Summers, with all due respect, Secretary Clinton. Yeah. Yeah. They were the architects. Sure, we'll we'll have a, we'll have an inclusive group, but I won't be taking my orders from Wall Street. And uh, look, let me say this: uh, I, I put out a proposal. I was on the front lines when people lost their homes, when people lost their jobs. I was on the front lines as a governor, uh, fighting against fighting that battle. Our economy was wrecked by the big banks of Wall Street. And Secretary Clinton, uh, uh, when you put out your proposal on Wall Street, it was great by many as quote unquote weak tea. It was weak tea. And that's why Bernie's right. We need to drink
know that when you had a chance to appoint a commissioner for financial regulation, you chose an investment banker in 2010. So for me, it is looking at what works and what we need to do to try to move past what happened in 08. And I will go back and say again, AIG was not a big bank. It had to be bailed out and it nearly destroyed us. Lehman Brothers was not a big bank, it was an investment bank, and its bankruptcy and its failure nearly destroyed us. So I've said, if the big banks don't play by the rules, I will break them up. The big and I will also go after executives who are responsible for the decisions that have such bad consequences for our country. I don't know, in all due respect to the secretary, Wall Street play by the rules. <laughs> Who are we kidding? <laughs> That's what it is. And we, we have... And let me make this promise. One of the problems we have had, I think, almost all Americans understand this, is whether it's Republican administrations or Democratic administrations. We have seen Wall Street and Goldman Sachs dominate administrations. Here's my promise. Wall Street representatives will not be in my cabinet. <laughs> Secretary Clinton, you said that Senator Sanders is not tough enough on guns, but basically he now supports roughly the same things you do. So can you tell us what the exact difference is going forward between the two of you on the issue of gun control? Well, I think that there are different uh, uh, records. Um, I, you know, know that uh, Senator Sanders uh, had a different vote than I did um, when it came to giving immunity to gun makers and sellers. That was a terrible mistake. It basically gave the gun lobby even more power to intimidate uh, legislators, not just in Washington, but across the country. But just think about this. Since we last debated in Las Vegas, nearly 3,000 people have been killed by guns. 21 mass shootings, including one last weekend in Des Moines where three were murdered. 200 children have been killed. This is an emergency. There are a lot of things we've got to do in our country. Reigning in Wall Street is certainly one of them. I agree with that. That's why I've got such a good plan. But we have to also go after the gun lobby. And 92% of Americans agree we should have universal background checks. Close the gun show loophole. Close the online <laughs> can as president to get that accomplished. Secretary Clinton, just a quick follow-up. You say that uh, Senator Sanders took a vote that, on immunity that you don't like. So if he can be tattooed by a single vote and that ruins all future uh, uh, is he right when he says your wrong vote on Iraq tattooed you? Uh, in the Senate that I uh, see in the audience. Let's reverse the immunity. Let's, 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 let's the gun makers and sellers on notice. <laughs> the immunity. But he was that a mistake? And uh, let me hear if there's any difference between the Senate and the Senate. I have voted time and again to for for the background check and I want to see it improved and expanded. I want to see us do away with the gun troll loophole. In 1988 I lost an election because I said we should not have assault weapons on the streets of America. We have to do away with this straw man proposal. We need radical changes in mental health in America. So somebody who is suicidal or homicidal to get the emergency care they need. So we have, I don't know that there's any disagreement here. Oh, yes, we sure. have oh, 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 oh. <laughs> 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 that in fact will work. Senator, yeah. a mistake or not in your immunity vote quickly before you. There were parts of that bill which I agree with, parts I disagree. I'm certainly, absolutely willing to look at that bill again and make sure so it's not a stronger bill. Not a mistake. Yeah. So, John, this is another one of those examples. Look, we have, a, we have a lot of work to do. And we're the only nation on the planet that buries as many of our people from gun violence as we do. In my own state, after the, the children in that Connecticut classroom were gunned down, we passed comprehensive uh, gun safety legislation with background checks, ban on assault weapons. And Senator, I think we do need to repeal that immunity that you granted to the gun industry. But Secretary Clinton, you've been on three sides of this. <laughs> 
Congress regulations. Then, in 2008, you were portraying yourself as Annie Oakley and saying that we don't need those regulations. Oh, she is. She's going to get slammed right and left on this There's a big difference between leading by polls and leading with principle. We got it done in my state by leading with principle, and that's what we need She's to do. She's too much of a flip flop. <laughs> Baltimore is not now one of the safest cities in America. But the issue is, it's a lot, the issue is, a lot of lives the all issue the way is I believe, and I believe this honestly, and I don't know that there's much difference on guns between us, but I believe, coming from a state that has virtually no gun control, I believe that I am in position to reach out to the 60 or 70 percent of the American people who agree with us on those issues. The problem is, hold on, people all over this country, not you, Secretary Clinton, are shouting at each other. And what we need to do is bring people together to work on the agreement where there is broad consensus. And that's why I'm... I'd like to bring I'd like to take a matter of personal privilege here. There is broad consensus. 92%. In the most recent poll of Americans, oh. want gun safety measures, absolutely, and 85 percent of gun owners agree. Yes, we've got the consensus. What we're lacking is political leadership, yes. and that's what you and others can start providing. Yes, yes. I'm going to bring in Nancy Cordes with a question from Twitter about this exchange. Uh, there was a lot of uh, conversation on Twitter uh, about guns, but also about your conversation on campaign finance. And Secretary Clinton, one of the tweets we saw uh, said this: "I've never seen a candidate invoke." 9-11 to justify to do taking big donations. Well, I'm sorry that whoever tweeted that impression because I worked closely with New Yorkers after 9-11 for my entire first term to rebuild. And so yes, I did know people. I've had a lot of folks who give me donations from all kinds of backgrounds say, I don't agree with you on everything, but I like what you do, I like how you stand up, I'm going to support you. And I think that is absolutely Well, I, I, if I might, I, I think the issue here is that I, I applaud Secretary Clinton. She did. And she's a senator from New York. She worked, and many of us supported you, in trying to rebuild that devastation. But at the end of the day, Wall Street today has enormous economic and political power. Their business model is greed and fraud. And for the sake of our economy, they must, the major banks, must be broken up. But, John, I think somewhere between sorry, the other two. But what is it in Secretary Clinton's record uh, that shows you that she's been influenced by those donations? Well, her influence is the, the major issue right now is whether or not we reestablish Glass-Steagall. I led the method, unfortunately unsuccessfully, against deregulation because I knew when you merged large insurance companies and investor banks and commercial banks, it was not going to be good. The issue now is do we break them up, do we reestablish Glass-Steagall, and Secretary Clinton, unfortunately, is on the wrong side. Well, I'll tell you that on my side, Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, who said oh, his plan so for what we should do to rein in Wall Street was more comprehensive and better. Paul Volcker, one of the leading lights of trying to rein in the excesses, has also said he does not support... Mm -hmm. Like a bit of an arcane discussion. I, I have nothing against the passion that my two friends here have about reinstating Glass Steagall. I just don't think it would get the job done. I'm all about making sure it actually gets results for whatever Final words, Governor Mallon, before we go to commercial. John, there is not a uh, serious economist who would disagree that the six big banks of Wall Street have taken on so much power and that all of us are still on the hook to bail them out on their bad bets. That's not capitalism, Secretary Clinton. Clinton, that's crony capitalism. That's a wonderful business model. If you place bad bets, the, the, the taxpayers bail you out, but if you place good ones, you pocket it. Look, I don't believe that the model, there's lots of good people that work in finance, Secretary Sanders, uh, but Secretary Clinton, we need to step up and we need to protect Main Street from Wall Street, and you can't do that by uh, by campaigning as the candidate of Wall Street. I am not the candidate of Wall Street, and I encourage everybody watching this tonight to uh, please uh, acknowledge that by going online at martinomalley.com and helping me to this campaign for real American capital. We have to go for a commercial second. I'm sorry. We have to go for a commercial.
Central here. We'll be right back with the Democratic debate here in Des Moines, Iowa on CBS. debate and who knows it might get uh, read on air well, there's probably thousands and thousands of things sent in Yeah. But there's a conservative revolution going on in America right now. As John Boehner knows, and as Democrats know, who have lost in state houses across the country. Those conservatives are watching tonight and probably shaking their heads. So <laughs> how do you deal with that part of the country? The revolution's already happening, but on the other side. And we are all going to do a political revolution which brings working people, young people, senior citizens, minorities together. Because every issue that I am talking about, paid family and medical leave, breaking up the banks on Wall Street, asking the wealthy to pay their fair share of taxes, rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure, raising the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour, every one of those issues is supported by a significant majority of the American people. Problem is that as a result of a corrupt campaign finance system, 
Congress is not listening to the American people. It's listening to the big money interest. What the political revolution is about is bringing people together to finally say enough is enough. This government belongs to us, not just the billionaires. Yeah. 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 Tonight, this figure 92% of support for background checks. Let's argue, let's look at that as, a, as an example. There was something 92% of the public was for. It. There had been these these mass shootings. There was emotional support behind it. Yes. Bipartisan support. Yes. The president, the full force of his office. Yep. It went nowhere. That's the model you're talking about. It, it nothing happened. What we need is leadership in this country, which revitalizes American democracy and makes people understand that if they stand up and fight back and take on the billionaire class, we can bring about the change that we need. If we are not successful, if we continue the same old, same old of Washington being run by corporate lobbyists and big money interests, nothing changes. Well, I am very happy in this campaign that we have had rallies with tens of thousands of people, mostly young people, what the polls are showing is that we are actually defeating the secretary among younger people. Yeah. We're giving young people and working people hope that real change can take place in America. That's what the political revolution is about. A question, a question from Kathy Radovich. Yes, uh, Senator Sanders, you famously said in the last debate that you were sick and tired of hearing about your damn emails. But then you told the Wall Street Journal that the questions about whether or not Secretary Clinton's emails compromised classified information were valid questions. Questions. So which is it? Is it uh, an issue or is it not? Just media stuff. I was sick and tired of Hillary Clinton's email. I am still sick and tired of Hillary Clinton's email. <laughs> and the issue is, the problem is the front pages every day we're dealing with that. I didn't know I had so much power. But after I said that, we're not hearing much about Hillary Clinton. <laughs> what I would like for the media now is for us to be talking about why the middle class is disappearing. Why we have more people in jail than any other country. Why we have massive levels of income and wealth inequality and the only major country in our family and medical leave. We've gotten off of Hillary's emails. Good. Let's go to the major issues. Thanks for the Americans to be involved in the political process, and I give Senator Sanders a lot of credit for really lighting a fire under many people, young, old, everybody, who sees a chance to be involved and have their voice heard. Look at what's happening with the Republicans. They are doing everything they can to prevent the voices of Americans to be heard. They're trying to prevent people from registering to vote. So we do need to take on the Republicans uh, very clearly and directly. But the other thing I just wanted quickly to say is, I think President Obama deserves more credit than he gets for what he got done uh, in Washington. Senator, so, just one uh, more question on the email question for Democrats. There's an FBI investigation going on. Can you satisfy Democrats who might worry about another shoe dropping, that you and your staff have been totally truthful to them and that another shoe's not going to drop? Well, I think after 11 hours, that's pretty clear. Yes. <laughs> important to do exactly what Senator Sanders said, and that is to start talking about the issues that the American people really care about and that they talk to each of us about, and to contrast. I mean, there are differences among us. You've heard some of those tonight. I still want to get back to health care because I think that's a worthy topic to explore, but the differences among us pale compared to what's happening on the Republican but, side. And if you listen to what they say, and I had a chance over those 11 hours to watch and listen as well as what I see in their debates, they are putting forth alarming plans. I mean, all of us support funding Planned Parenthood. All of us believe climate change is real. All of us want equal pay for equal work. They don't believe in any of that. So let's focus on what this election is really gonna be about. Don't 
Space relations is another issue everyone cares about, and we're going to switch to that now. Governor O'Malley, let me ask you a question. The, the head of the FBI recently said it might be possible that some police forces are not enforcing the law because they're worried about being caught on camera. The acting head of the Drug Enforcement Administration said a similar thing. Where, where are you on this question, and what would you do if you were president and two top members of your administration were floating that idea? Well, look, John, I think the I think the call of your question is how can we improve both public safety in America and race relations in America, understanding how very intertwined both of those issues are in a very, very difficult and painful way for us as a people. Look, the truth of the matter is that we should all feel a sense of responsibility as Americans to look for the things that actually work to save and redeem lives and to do more of them and to stop doing the things that don't. For my part, that's what I have done in 15 years of experience as a mayor and as a governor. We restored voting rights to 52,000 people. We decriminalized possession of small amounts of, America, of marijuana. Uh, I repealed the death penalty, and we also put in place a civilian review board. We reported openly discourtesy and, and lethal force and brutality complaints. This is something that, and I put forward a new ag agenda for criminal justice reform that is in formed by that experience. So as president, I would lead these efforts and I would do so with more experience and probably the attendance of more gravesides than any of the three of us on this stage when it comes to urban uh, crime, loss of lives. And uh, the truth is uh, I have learned on a very daily basis that yes, indeed, black lives matter. Oh my God. Oh my God. One of your former colleagues, an African-American member of Congress, said to me recently that a young African-American man had asked him where to find hope in life, and he said, I just don't know what to tell him about being young and black in America today. What would you tell that young African-American man? Well, this is what I would say, and the congressman was right. Uh, according to the statistics that I'm familiar with, a black male baby born today stands a one in four chance of ending up in the criminal justice system. 51% of high school African American graduates are unemployed or underemployed. We have more people in jail today than any other country on earth. We're spending $80 billion locking people up disproportionately Latino and African American. We need very clearly major, major reform in a broken criminal justice system. And that means when police officers out in a community do illegal activity, kill people who are unarmed, who should not be killed, they must be held accountable. for those people arrested. It means that we take marijuana out of the federal law as a crime and give states the freedom to go forward with legalizing marijuana. There's a difference between rhetoric and activism and what you were trying to do which was enforce law or get laws passed that would help what they were pushing for. But uh, recently at the University of Missouri, that activism was very, very effective. So would you suggest that kind of activism take place at other universities across the country? Well, John, I come from uh, the 60s, a long time ago. There was a lot of activism on campus, um, civil rights activism, anti-war activism, women's rights activism. Um, and I do uh, appreciate the way young people um, are standing up and speaking out. Obviously, I believe that on a college campus, there should be enough respect so people hear each other. Uh, but what happened uh, at the university there, what's happening at other universities, I think reflects the deep sense of you know, concern, even despair, that so many young people, particularly of color, have. You know, I recently met with a group of mothers who lost their children to uh, either um, killings by police or random killings uh, in their neighborhoods uh, and hearing their stories was so incredibly profoundly heartbreaking each one of them you know described their child had a picture you know the mother of the 
young man with his friends in the car who was playing loud music and you know some older white man pulled out a gun and shot him because they wouldn't turn the radio down or a young woman who had been uh, performing at President Obama's second inauguration, coming home, an, an absolutely stellar young woman, hanging out with her friends in a park, getting shot by a gang member. And of course, I, I met the mothers of Eric Garner and Tamir Rice and Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin and so many of them who have lost their children. So your original question is the right question. And it's not just a question for parents and grandparents to answer. It's really a question for all of us to answer. Every single one of our children deserves the chance to live up to his or her God-given potential. And that's what we need to be doing to the best of our ability in right. our country. Over to Kevin Curry. Thank you. Senator Sanders We've heard a lot about this, your offer. Uh, your, you want to offer free tuition in public universities and colleges. We have a couple of questions about this. 63% of those who enroll graduate. First question, isn't this throwing a lot of money away if we're looking at it? It is an extraordinary investment for this country. Uh, Germany, many other countries do it already. Uh, in fact, as you remember, 50, 60 years ago, University of California, City University of New York, were virtually tuition free. Here is the story. It's not just that college graduates should be 50 or or $100,000 in debt. More importantly, I want kids in Burlington, Vermont, or Baltimore, Maryland, who are in the sixth grade or the eighth grade, who don't have a lot of money, whose parents, like my parents, may never have gone to college. Do you know what I want, Kevin? I want those kids to know that if they study hard, they do their homework, regardless of the income of their families, they will in fact be able to get a college education because we're going to make public colleges and universities tuition free. This is revolutionary for education in America. It will give hope to millions of young people. There are 16 states that are running budget deficits right now. Where are they expected to come up? Well, I think that they're going to be pretty smart because I think a lot of states will do the right thing, and I think those states that don't will pay a heavy penalty. Bottom line here is in the year 2015, we should look at a college degree the same way we looked at a high school degree 50 or 60 years ago. If you want to make it into the middle class, I'm not saying in all cases, we need to put plumbers and we need carpenters and electricians, that's for sure, and they should get help as well. But bottom line now is, in America, in the year 2015, any person who has the ability and the desire should be able to get an education, college education, regardless of the income of his or her family, and we must substantially lower, as my legislation does, interest rates on student debt. <laughs> much of what Senator Sanders says, Kevin. I, I believe that actually affordable college, debt-free college, is the goal that we need to attain as a nation. And uh, unlike my two distinguished colleagues on this stage, I actually made college more affordable and was the only state that went four years in a row without a penny's increase to college tuition. I respectfully disagree with Senator Sanders' approach. Uh, I believe that the goal should be debt-free college. I believe that our federal government needs to do more on Pell Grants. States need to stop cutting higher education, and we should create a new block grant program that keeps the state skin in the game, and we should lower these outrageous interest rates that parents and kids are being charged by their own government, 7 and 8 percent to go to college. I mean, my dad went to college on a GI Bill after coming home from Japan, flying 33 missions. My daughters went to college on a mountain of bills. Now, we were proud of them on graduation day, but we're going to be proud every month for the rest of our natural lives. <laughs> it doesn't need to be that way. We can have that free college in the United States. Kevin, if I could just jump in. I, um, I believe that we should make community college free. We should have debt-free college. If you go to a public college or university, you should not have to borrow a dime to pay tuition. I want to use Pell Grants to help defray uh, the uh, living expenses that often make a difference whether a young person can stay in school or not. I disagree with free college for everybody. I don't think taxpayers should be paying to send Donald Trump's kids to college. I think it ought to be a compact families 
contribute, kids contribute, and together we make it possible for a new generation of young people to refinance their debt and not come out with debt in the future. All right, Nancy Gordas has a question. Back to health care by popular demand. Uh, first to you, Senator Sanders. You prefer to scrap Obamacare. Mm. Medicare for all, uh, you say you with the private insurance companies out of business. Is it realistic to think that you can pull the plug on a one trillion dollar industry? It's not going to happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not going to happen until we have real campaign finance reform and get rid of all these super PACs and the power of the insurance companies and the drug companies. But at the end of the day, Nancy, here is the question. In this great country of ours, with so much intelligence and so much capability, why do we remain the only major country on earth that does not guarantee health care to all people as a right? Why do we continue to get ripped off by the drug companies who can charge us any prices they want? Why is it that we are spending per capita far, far more than Canada, which is 100 miles away from my door that guarantees health care to all people? It will not happen tomorrow. But when millions of people stand up and are prepared to take on the insurance companies and the drug companies, it will happen, and I will lead that effort. Medicare for all, single payer system is the way we should go. You said that momentum for a single payer system would sweep the country. That sounds Sanders esque, uh, but you don't feel that way anymore. Well, the revolution never came. <laughs> I waited and I got the scars to show for it. Um, we now have this great accomplishment known as the Affordable Care Act, and I don't think we should have to be defending it among Democrats. We ought to be working to improve it and prevent Republicans from both undermining it and even repealing it. I have looked at, I've looked at the legislation that Senator Sanders has proposed, and basically he does eliminate the Affordable Care Act, eliminates private insurance, eliminates Medicare, eliminates Medicaid, TRICARE, Children's Health Insurance Program, puts it all together in a big program which he then hands over to the states to administer. And I have to tell you, I would not want, if I lived in Iowa, Terry Branstead administering my health care. <laughs> We ought to proudly support the Affordable Care Act, improve it, and make it the model that we know it can be. Well, let me just say something. We don't, we don't eliminate Medicare. We expand Medicare to all people. And we will not, under this proposal, have a situation that we have right now with the Affordable Care Act. We have states like South Carolina and many other Republican states that because of their right-wing political ideology are denying millions of people the expansion of Medicaid that we passed in the Affordable Care Act. Ultimately, we have got to say as a nation, Secretary Clinton, is health care a right of all people or is it not? I believe it is. Man, just been after the third check out. And we've got to take a break or the machine breaks down. You're watching the Democratic debate here on the CBS.
lower blood sugar in adults with type 2 diabetes. Indirects can help your body to get these scars and sugar and diabetes through urination. This can help you lower blood sugar and maintain your blood. And it leads to a lower blood sugar and lower blood sugar and blood pressure. Jordan is good for the food. Jordan can cause serious side effects, including dehydration. This can cause you to feel dizzy, faint, or lighted, or weak upon standing. Other side effects are general yeast infections, urinary tract infections, changes in urination, kidney problems, increased bad cholesterol. Do not take Jardines if you are on dialysis or have severe kidney problems. Please don't take the Jardines and call your doctor right away if you have symptoms of a allergic reaction. Symptoms can include rash, swelling, and difficulty with your swallowing. Take the Jardines with a small quality rate of what is and may cause low blood sugar. Tell your doctor about all the medicines you take and if you have any medical conditions. So talk to your doctor, and for details, visit Jardians.com. It is an amazing responsibility to have someone else's livelihood in your hands. I'm learning counting software, coding, my business. 19 years ago, I started here. I started minimum wage, worked my way up, eventually became a general manager. So long as it doesn't create a good for society. It's beyond just a place of work. Our paycheck is not that we're family, and they love this place, and they love what we do. No national interest in continuing to import lesser skilled and unskilled workers to compete in the most vulnerable parts of our labor force. Many American workers do not have adequate job prospects. We should make their task easier to. Equal by Numbers USA. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. very small group that had to advise the president about whether or not to go after bin Laden. We spent a lot of time in the situation uh, as Secretary of State, and there were many very difficult uh, choices presented to us, but probably that was the most uh, challenging because there was no certainty attached to it. Uh, the intelligence was by no means absolute. Uh, we had all kinds of uh, questions that we discussed, and you know, at the end, uh, I recommended to the president that we take uh, the chance uh, to do what um, we could to find out whether that was bin Laden and to finally uh, bring him to justice. Uh, it was an excruciating experience. I couldn't talk to anybody about it. In fact, after it happened, the president called my husband. He called all the former presidents and he said to Bill, well, I, I assume Hillary's told you about this. And Bill said, no, no, she hasn't. Um, there was nobody to talk to and it, it really did give me an insight into the very difficult problems presidents yep. face. Governor O'Malley, what crisis proves that you're tested? John, I don't I don't think that there is a crisis at the state or local level that really you can point to and say, therefore I am prepared for the sort of crises that any man or woman who is the commander in chief of our country has to deal with. But I can tell you this. I can tell you that, that as a mayor and as a governor, I learned certain disciplines which I believe are directly applicable to that very, very uh, uh, powerful and most important of all jobs in the United States president whose first and primary duty is to protect the people of our country 
you learn that threats always change. You learn to create uh, a security cabinet. You learn to create feedback mechanisms. You learn to constantly evaluate and understand the nature of the threats that you are being faced with. I have been tried under many different emergencies, uh, and uh, I can tell you that in each of those emergencies, whether they were uh, and that they were uh, inflicted by by drug gangs, whether they were natural emergencies, I knew how to lead and I knew how to govern because I know how to manage people in a crisis and be very clear about the goal of protecting human life. Senator Sanders, what experience did you draw on in the crisis? Yeah. Uh, I had the honor of being chairman of the U.S. Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs for two years, and in that capacity, I met with just an extraordinary group of people from World War II, from Korea, Vietnam, all of the wars. People came back from Iraq and Afghanistan without legs, without arms. And I was determined to do everything that I could to make VA healthcare the best in the world, to expand benefits to the men and women who put their lives on the line to defend me. We brought together legislation supported by the American Legion, the VFW, the DAV, Vietnam Vets, all of the veterans' organizations, which was comprehensive, clearly the best piece of veterans' legislation brought forth in decades. I could only get two Republican votes on that. We ended up with 56 votes, we needed 60. So what I had to do then is go back and start working on a bill that wasn't the bill that I wanted. Sit down with people like John McCain. Sit down with people like Jeff Miller, the Republican chairman of the House, and work on a bill. It wasn't the bill that I wanted, but yet it turned out to be one of the most significant pieces of veterans legislation passed in recent history. So the crisis was, I lost what I wanted, but I had to stand up and come back and get the best that we could. All right, Senator Sanders. We've ended the evening on crisis, which underscores or reminds us again of what happened last night. Now let's move to closing statements. Governor O'Malley. John, thank you. And to all of the people of Iowa for the role that you perform in this presidential selection process. If you believe that our country's problems and the threats that we face in this world can only be met with new thinking, new and fresh approaches, then I ask you to join my campaign. Go on to martinomalley.com. No hour is too short, no dollar too small. If you, We will not solve our nation's problems by resorting to the divisive ideologies of our past or by returning to polarizing figures from our past. We are at the threshold of a new era of American progress, but it's going to require that we act as Americans based on our principles. Here at home, making an economy that works for all of us, and also acting according to our principles and constructing a new foreign policy of engagement and collaboration and doing a much better job of identifying threats before they back us into military corners. There is no challenge too great for the United States to confront, provided we have the ability and the courage to put forward new leadership that can move us to those better and safer and more prosperous days. I need your help. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you very much to um, CBS and everyone here this evening for giving us another chance uh, to appear before you. Um, I've heard a lot about me uh, in this debate, and I'm going to keep talking and thinking about all of you, uh, because ultimately, I think the president's job uh, is to do everything possible, everything that she can do to lift up the people of this country, starting with our children. I've spent my entire life, since I started as a young lawyer for the Children's Defense Fund, trying to figure out how we can even the odds for so many people in America, this great country of ours, who are behind, who don't have a chance. And that's what I will do as your president. I will work my heart out. I need your help. All of you in Iowa, I need you to caucus for me. Please go to HillaryClinton.com and be part of making this country what we know it can and should be. Has more income and wealth inequality than any major country on earth. We have a corrupt campaign finance system dominated by super PACs. We are the only major country on earth that doesn't guarantee health care to all people. We have the highest rate of childhood poverty. 
that we're the only country in the world, or virtually the only country, because of guaranteed paid family and medical leave. That's not the America that I think we should be. But in order to bring about the changes that we need, we need a political revolution. Millions of people are going to have to stand up, turn off the TV, get involved in the political process, and tell the big money interest that we are taking back our country. Please go to BernieSanders.com. Please become part of the political revolution. Thank you. for y'all. First one, how'd you think Barry did? Think he did pretty well? I thought he did pretty well myself. Um, the second question I have, who here, show of hands, has seen Bernie in person before? All right, so a few, few of you, maybe, maybe the majority. Well, um, I have one small announcement, um, and that's that after tonight, all of you will be able to raise your hands. Obviously, he's right across the street, but there, there are quite a few people over there, so it's going to take just a couple minutes. Uh, but we want to make sure to give Bernie a warm welcome when he gets here, right? We want to make sure he feels the burn. We want him to come into a crowd. Oh, uh, your mic is off. Mic, mic off. We want to make sure that he feels welcome here, right? All right, so to that end, we're going to practice a couple chants. Uh, to get ourselves fired up, and, and maybe we'll uh, we'll do one as Bernie comes on in. How does that sound, everyone? All right. So I'm gonna hand the mic over to Stan here. Stan's got a couple of chants for us. All right. Let's go. Let's go. I say field up. You say burn. Field up. Field up. When I say people, you say power. I think this this one here knows some chance, is that right? All right, let's get our feet for this one. All right, all right, all right. So, uh, so Bernie Sanders is going to come over here, so it's going to get excited in a little bit. That there is a movement. A revolution, if you will, underway. And uh, it's time for a revolution. It's time for a revolution. I don't, I don't hear you. Is it time for a revolution? Thank 
know, we gotta have another pun, right? We gotta have this pun. So, we believe that uh, we should have an end to college debt. So when I say end, I want you to say, when I say end, you who uh, knows a couple chants for us. You want to come on up here? All right, come on, yeah! Yeah! All right, what's your name? Brian Kroll. Brian, all right, you got a couple chants for us? Uh, I'm going to try. Uh, we got Can you hear me back, back there? Yeah. I can't hear you back there. Yeah. Louder! Yeah! Who do we want? students who have some student debt chants in the room? John Ashton, I'm looking at you. Anything come to mind, John? Crying! <laughs> He's a crying. Two minutes. Yeah. Banks got bailed out, we got sold out? Two minutes to student debt chants. Anyone else know a couple chants in here? Of course, that's a classic Occupy chant. All right. Yeah, I'm an occupier and I'm proud of it. Our country! Our country! Our country is what she's doing. Now! 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 Now!
is under the attack. Secret Service calling all over. So people are just doing various chants and things. So the rumor is uh, Bernie will come over here once he uh, is done doing an, whatever he's doing over at Chesco. He probably doing interviews and uh, maybe right. grabbing a little refreshment. All right, I'm going to get the mic over to Drew. Drew is in direct communication with the senators uh, group. And great news, as of a couple of minutes ago, they are on their way over. That's right, he is on his way over here. He's, right, he's got to right come across the street. So we'll the street. Yeah. yeah, for sure. All right, so, so we've got a lot of chance here right now. Um, 
as we're waiting for him to show up, we definitely want to have him going while he gets here, right? Who, who, what was the favorite chant we just did? Did someone start a chant that we just did that they liked the best? highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country. We have more income and wealth inequality than any other major country. 
Countries all over the world are providing free tuition for their colleges and universities. We are not. Why can't we accomplish those goals? We can! Why can't we lead the world in transforming our energy system? Think what it means. We will. Yes, we we will. will. That's right. We can do that. Think of what it means in America when we are seen all over the world as a force fighting for world peace. Think of what it means in our country when people finally have some hope. But as I've said many, many times, it is not just Bernie Sanders. I cannot do it alone. If I get elected to the White House and you guys are not there with me, I will not be a happy character. So we can do this, we can do this together. And the good news is that we have a real path to victory. Yes. All right? Yes. And the path starts right here in your great state in Iowa. If we work hard, I believe we're going to win Iowa. Woo! And I believe, I believe that we are going to win New Hampshire. Yes. And if we win in Iowa, and we win in New Hampshire, I'm afraid our friends in the establishment are going to get a little bit nervous. <laughs> Because at that point, the argument that we can't win dissolves. We can win. We have the people behind us. We are raising significant sums of money, not through super PACs, but through individual contributions. We have volunteers all over America and thousands right here in Iowa. So, brothers and sisters, what we are talking about, this is just not a campaign to elect Bernie Sanders to the White House. This is a campaign to bring about structural changes in the entire United States of America, to make our country a very, very different place. And the only way to do it, go ahead. the only way to do it is when millions of people come together and say, enough, enough is enough. enough. Thank you all. Yeah. side of the room. Go ahead. That's okay. That's okay. Go ahead. I think it went up the other side. Yeah. To go What's up? How are you? I'm awesome. I can tell. <laughs> so I'm just stitched a cup. I'm just gonna stick it in some random cup holder. Show on my uh, where my jacket is. Looks like people are going outside. I'll probably have to switch back to my monocle. 
if, if the action is going to keep going, then... I'm not sure if this will keep going or not, but if it does... Taking time to collapse my tripod now that I've taken my phone off of it. in the bag later. Get out of here, apparently. <laughs> the consensus that I'm here in front of the crops that I'm here in front of the few that are immediately behind me is that uh, Hillary Clinton really uh, screwed herself. Say so Bernie came out on top, and then Martin O'Malley did second best, and uh, Hillary Clinton screwed herself. 
I'm still alive. <laughs> Haven't killed my stream yet. Just on the off chance that there might be a little something going on outside. my light on. Does that help? Oh, that's, that's president, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> no. Well, I will be. I will not be an Iowa citizen, though, because I will be in the grass. Oh, right. That's okay. I will vote for him no matter what. Do you need my name at all? Um, I'm going to just put it here. I am not. You're welcome. There must be some noise outside. I gotta follow the noise.
Well, I'm still alive. Oh, good. I'm still screaming. I'm still alive. I'm I'm burning uh, juice off my one of my power packs. All right, all right. That's how I can go for a long stream. Right, nice. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Nathan. There's a guy who greets me with the greeting that Muslims used to greet each other. Assalamu alaikum, and I return it by saying alaikum salam. Oh, cutie alert, you're so cute. Now I see you awake. Weren't you sleeping earlier? Yeah, finally woke up. Oh, you time. are too cute. Yes, you are. <laughs> Quite a few people out here, so I think I'm gonna Yeah, well, the EPC on the 16th 
Okay. It's coming to the CCI office at 6 p.m. Okay, I'm going to try and make that. Give them some, uh, you know, more support. Yeah. 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 So that should be interesting to say the least. It will. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, she's breaking. Lovely to see you again. Yep. I got a car. You all have rides? Yeah, mine is called the Dark Bus. My ride is called the Dark Bus. <laughs> You, you rock it. Okay, uh, I worked in health care for a time, so I know how that goes. It's grunt work, but someone's got to do it, and someone's got to, and, the, and you know, nurses, uh, of all levels, need respect. Looks like everybody's starting to leave, so I'm going to go ahead and take my stream down and uh, pack it all in. But I do want to thank you for watching. And uh, so. I'm trying to figure out your attire. Are you Muslim? Yeah, or? Muslim. Yeah, Muslim. I, I figure it's either Catholic nun or a Muslim. No. Nope. Nope, I'm Muslim. I remember the days back when the nuns dressed kind of like that. Yeah. Some still do. Some still do. Yeah. I know. I went to preschool in the 60s when there was nuns running them. Yeah. But they were good people. Yeah, they were I know. They, they I were know against when, the war. Yeah. And they were nuns poor. on the bus. Nuns, exactly. Yeah, if like you that. ever met them. I've heard about them. If you, They're if you radical. Got, They're as yeah, radical as I streamed them when they came here yeah. about a uh, year and a half ago. Yeah. And they're as radical and, uh, as as Bernie is. Yeah, and and as, and as Code Pink, they're yeah. all radical groups. And Madea came, Madea came yeah. here to Des Moines last year, and she appeared at the airport when there was a drone protest. Exactly. And uh, you oh, know. Oh jeez, what a shameful chicken shit way to fight war. Yeah. Drones. And yeah. It, and it just and it just desensitizes people yeah. even further to war. That's what's. That's what's yeah. so god awful shameful about it. I know it. Later on, yeah. man. Yep. I'll be around streaming something or other. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, before I do shut down, I want to thank you all for watching. I want to thank any restream channel that may have uh, picked up my feed and rebroadcasted it. And uh, you know, spread my audience. Whether it be Blood Black Tigers Network or any of the other ones, thanks for doing that. Whether you were interested more in a debate or or you wanted to uh, it was something different than just uh, some uh, new stuff. But uh, yeah, I also want to uh, ask you to uh, check out my donation sites on. Uh, so you can kick me a little if you can. I do this on my own dime. I don't work for anyone but you, the viewers. And uh, I'm also trying to shut my tablet down because I'm done with it. I also want to uh, ask you to give me a little if you can. If you cannot, then. Uh, Spread them around. Let uh, let people know that uh, I'm currently the only streamer here in Des Moines, but I'm hoping to change that soon, as soon as uh, Carrie gets her uh, Iowa stuff set up, so that uh, she won't be fooling people think into thinking that she's uh, streaming in Hawaii. But uh, but here in Des Moines, but she's still got to get some more. Uh, stuff set up here and 
So if you can go to www.gofundme.com slash Occupier Kaylin, that's K-A-Y-L-Y-N-N. Again, www.gofundme.com slash Occupier Kaylin. Or if you cannot go through GoFundMe or you don't have access to, you don't have any of the currencies that it supports, you can go through PayPal at www.paypal.com. And then the Sun Money Tool line, enter the email address S-T-R-A-I-N-S-T-R-A-I-N-S-T-R-A-I-N-S-T-R-A-I-N-S-T-R-A-I-N-S-T-R-A-I-N-S-T-R-A-I-N-S-T-R-A-I-N-S-T-